Hey, welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. Still lost in Oslo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that lost. I'm in a little people aquarium. I've been here a lot. We've been here for months. Months and months. <laughs> Good Lord. We uh, went out on a boat cruise last night, which yeah, we, we, did. Did, we do with the speakers every year. Yeah, and uh, you have to peel your own shrimp, which means you have to work for your dinner. But it's beautiful out there. It is lovely. Yeah. It was a beautiful night. The sun sets very late this time of year in, in Oslo. So I and it doesn't really set at all. No. You know, it, think about it's it. Down, it's down around midnight, but it's back at like three. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's fun. All right. Well, I got something interesting for Better Know Framework. So awesome. roll the music. <laughs> got there, man. Had breakfast with James Montemagno uh, today. It's always got to be fun. And I asked him what... You know, James has written tons of these plugins for Xamarin. Oh, yeah. And I asked him what some of his favorite ones were, and this is one. It's the connectivity plugin. Oh. So the connectivity plugin is basically a cross platform tool that checks the connection status of your mobile device, and it gives you the connection types and bandwidths and whether you're reachable or an IP address is reachable. Oh, nice. That kind of thing. So just a, a, way, a quick way for you to check whether or not. You're yeah. online. Is connected. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty easy. And then all the connection types and, as I said before, the, the bandwidths. And, yeah, how much bandwidth we got? Should we operate a different mode? And this is not just for Xamarin. Yeah. No. Well, it's, it's cross-platform. So it is Xamarin. Okay. But, of course, it works on Xamarin uh, iOS, tvOS, which is Apple TV, Android, you know, phone RT, phone Silverlight, cool. Store RT, Windows 10, Xamarin, Mac, and .NET 4. Five WPF. Wow, that's a, that's quite a span. It's pretty cool. That James Montemagno, he is so clever. He is. Well, that's what I got. I've actually used this, and it works great. Oh, that's great. And it's just a easy way. So to he solve just reminded you at uh, yeah. at breakfast yep. about a, something you a framework you already knew about. Yep, I like that. Yeah, it's good stuff. Cool. No, I learned to love it. Who's talking to us, brother? Uh, I grabbed a comment off of show 1347, the one we did with Mark Rendell back in September of 2016, talking about simple.data.core. You mean it's not a mollusk? It's not a mollusk. And there's a, one of the comments <laughs> is, can somebody explain the mollusk joke yeah, to right. me? And I, you know what? No, not no, going go to. Go listen gonna, to it. You'll get it. leave that hanging right there. Yeah. I just saw Mark Rendell, so mm -hmm. uh, he's here. He's tired. He's doing too many talks. Yeah, me too. So that, which I find amusing. Me uh, too. I'm here, and I also and saw him. This comment comes from Barrett, who says, I'm glad I could set up your show. I'll be watching for the residual checks. So he was actually <laughs> commenting in the previous show. But seriously, though, I'm looking forward to giving a .NET Core a try. Mm. Got a couple of new projects with .NET Core. I'm pondering my data access methodology. So he's actually talking about maybe using simple.data. And, and Barrett, if I can encourage you, admittedly months later, you might want to talk about Cosmos DB2 because mm. we're going to be talking about it today. Yep. So, Barrett, thank you so much for your comment. A .NET Rocks mug is on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks .com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Google Plus and Facebook. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. They're cross-platform. <laughs> and they and are fully too. indexable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's talk to Josh Lane. Josh is a Microsoft Azure MVP and Azure instructor at cloudacademy.com. He's also the founder and organizer of Azure in the ATL, one of the largest Azure meetups in the U.S. When I heard ATL, I thought active template library, but that's just because I'm old. <laughs> oh, Rich, uh, that's, no, 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 that's way too old. Actually, no. I'm, I am that old too, but I don't like to admit it. All right. <laughs> well, he spent almost 20 years architecting and building enterprise software for companies around the world in industries as diverse as financial services, insurance, energy, education, and telecom. He loves the challenges that come with designing, building, and running software at scale. Away from the keyboard, you'll find him outdoors with his family, skiing, mountain biking, drumming, or drinking good beer with good friends, he tweets at J-P-L-A-N-E, J-P Lane, drummer. Uh, and to clarify, not outdoors. So oh, I kind of yeah, noticed, yeah, yeah. The, noticed the, the way that sentence structure yeah, uh, yeah. is written. It sort of sounds like I drum outdoors, which would actually piss off my neighbors a lot more than, ah. than I already do. Which you is, know what the drummer got on his SATs? Yeah, I've heard a lot of these <laughs> jokes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Drool. <laughs> <laughs> What's a, the, I heard a good one the other day, actually. Uh, the guy I play with, uh, guitar player, he said, uh, well, uh, what is it? Uh, what's the difference between a pizza, a large pizza, and a drummer? Yeah, the pizza. P pizza can feed a family of four. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What do you call a drummer with no girlfriend? 
homeless. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call a guy who hangs around with musicians? A drummer. <laughs> no. How about what do you, how do you get a guitar player to turn down and play less? Put some sheet music in front of him. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I could go on yeah. and on. Yeah. So I, I uh, again to clarify, uh, not only do I not drum outdoors, but I, I I've only been doing this for a couple of years. It's oh, a cool. bit of a hobby. Yeah. Um, kind of picked it up. Uh, 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 I, I read a book or a newspaper article or something about, you know, that it's good when you turn 40, like to, you know, get a little older, like become a rookie at something, right? Right, right. Um, as kids, we're really good at, at, uh, at you know, every, we're, we're new at everything, right? Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're kind of good at learning and, and you're, you know, it comes easy and it's good for your brain and it's right. just good for your energy. And yeah, so I, I uh, decided a couple years ago, I have a few friends who play uh, guitar and bass and they yeah, were kind of yeah. joking with me and said, Hey, you know, hey, you ought to play the, play the drums. We'll have a little three-piece, the, you know, the awesome. police, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's been fun. Fantastic. Yep. It's great. And I, I thoroughly recommend everybody learns how to play an instrument, not because you want to be a great player, but it's therapy. Right. Yeah. It's therapy. My, my kit literally sits, uh, you know, I have my desk in my home office. Kit sits right behind my chair mm. 20, 30 minutes a day. You know, I push away the keyboard, yeah. turn around piss off the neighbors for a little while nice. and then get back to it. So it's fun. Well, you, when I started, I got a, an electronic drum kit. You know? yep. So it was great because Me too. you could wear headphones and nobody gets mad. Yeah. So the, the only, I, I did the same. The only problem with the electronic drum, drum kit um, is um, I actually uh, beat up the snare pretty bad just uh. because I... I uh, I wanted it to be loud, you know, right. and I, and it, and yeah, so I, I actually messed up the snare and got to the point where it didn't really work very huh. well. Huh. And so, oh, well, if I, if I'm honest, that was the excuse to get a real kit. So, okay. Yeah. Good enough. So Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB. Yes. Announced everywhere. A announced a build six weeks ago. Um, I sort of figured when I uh, came to speak here at NDC, uh, I'd be owing somebody in the audience a nickel or a, a kroner for uh, for every time I said document DB instead of Cosmos DB. Oh right. But I I, I, would, I did actually manage to not uh, use that term at all. Uh, so is it just talk. a rebranding of document DB? Partially, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, it definitely a bit of a marketing kind of rebranding thing, but but. Uh, to be fair, there were uh, several additional new capabilities mm -hmm. kind of built uh, built into uh, this release. Uh, really, uh, the you know kind of the story goes: if you go back to like 2010, um, uh, there was a project called Microsoft Fl or uh, Project Florence that was right. spun up internally uh, at Microsoft. Uh, Office 365, uh, Xbox, and a few other teams were uh, uh, several teams kind of internally were kind of struggling with this this notion of building big geo scale uh, data stores right and so the the uh, the thinking was let's get a team together to kind of solve this problem once and for all and they worked on it a couple of years and, and built something that that worked really well for everybody internally and then 2015 they said well gee let's let's uh, release this thing to the uh, out to the masses uh, yeah. and so that if you're an Azure customer you can you can uh, opt into it. Uh, but but really, what they uh, document that was document DB, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. DocDB was uh, was kind of a it was a JSON uh, document store specifically. Yeah. But as it turns out, that was only a subset of the the actual kind of true functionality. Okay. Um, so the bigger the bigger picture, which now we start to see with Cosmos. Uh, you you get uh, graph oriented data. You have uh, MongoDB uh, yeah. compatibility layer, which has kind of been there for a little while. Right. Um, table storage compatibility yeah. layer, and there's more coming. I mean, and this relational is a, too, right? Not yet. Okay. Uh, or I should <laughs> I should say. Uh, there is nothing in there today that's specific to uh, relational data stores. Now, are we talking um, document DB or Cosmos? This or is Cos. This is Cosmos. I mean, okay. it's both, really. Um, but uh, the the team has sort of stated that th their ambitions, and you can kind of look at what they've done with some of the compatibility layers, the MongoDB and table mm -hmm. table storage API compatibility. Uh, and you can kind of see their thinking and and some of the things that they've talked about. Uh, they want to explore scenarios like relational and some other 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 areas. But they have a perfectly good relational database in SQL Server, so the real issue becomes availability and, and, um, and performance, right? Sure. Uh, and it's that, and it's also, uh, fun, more fundamentally, it's, it's what, your, what your use case is. Yeah. And, and actually, yeah. now that we're on the, the relational topic, and I mentioned this in my talk yesterday, but I think it's worth, uh, it's worth mentioning, um, 
th this doesn't sort of signal the, 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 the rise uh, to prominence of something like Cosmos DB does not signal sort of the beginning of the end of relational no, of data stores, yeah. right? No. Uh, and, you know, I mean, to, hopefully to most, most listeners and, and reasonable folks, that's, that's not news. Uh, but, but let's be honest, in, in our industry, it's, you know, sometimes we get these blinders on and we think, oh, here's the, the shiny know, new thing. Yeah. yeah, the one right way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's not, that's not what's happening here. And, it, you know, document DB... This is not just documents anymore. So I guess no. the document DB is kind of a problematic name. But I was also getting to a point where it's like, well, how many different flipping data stores do we need to choose from here, right? <laughs> like, I kind of like the idea that there's Cosmos and it's a bunch of different ways to store data. But isn't we Cos don't need separate tools. Isn't Cosmos DB really about availability and, and latency, isn't it? I it's mean, a, you, pay more, you pay a premium to get one millisecond latency, right? Yeah, it, and it's uh, the SLA in particular um, kind of revolves around four kind of key metrics. It's uh, latency throughput, availability, and consistency of your data. Right. The, the, the whole con, there's a whole, we, we'll, we can talk about it in a few minutes, but there's a whole angle regarding data consistency because you're in a distributed system at this sure. point, right? Yeah. It's not a SQL Server instance sitting on a single box anymore. Right. Um, so there's a, there's a whole aspect and discussion around consistency, and that's, that's pretty interesting in and of itself. And, but and yeah, you're right. But you do pay the premium, right? I mean, what is the sure. expense for Cosmos to be uh, the price? So the, the pricing, it's you pay uh, per unit of storage, so uh, I think it's a a quarter U.S. Uh, for a gigabyte of storage. Uh, and then I looked up the pricing the other day just to find out what the latest was. And as I recall, it was a quarter for uh, a gig per gigabyte of storage on SSDs. So mm -hmm. it's, it's fast storage. Um, and then it's... Uh, uh, eight one is it eight one hundredths of a cent? I believe it is uh, point zero zero eight uh, cents per uh, one hundred request units. So wow. if you're, yeah, and it, but cheap. Yeah, more or less what it comes out to. So uh, I ran a couple of numbers just so I you know you know could uh, could talk about it a little bit. So if you I think if you have like a hundred gigabyte database, if you have a thousand request units per second, and we can talk about what that means. Yeah. Um, uh, over the course of a month, that's about 60, 70 bucks, something that's like not that. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. It all comes down to what a request unit really is. Yep. And how many of them you need right. per second. Um, and that's, that's actually a, a, a one of the things. There are a couple of, of, uh, of aspects of adopting Cosmos that maybe are a little tricky mm -hmm. um, or difficult from the perspective of, of somebody who's comfortable with relational uh, mm -hmm. databases. One of them is one of them is the that notion of data consistency that we talked about a moment or we haven't really talked about yet, mm -hmm. but um, that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, the other big one, uh, frankly, is understanding the the understanding what kind of throughput you what your throughput requirements are for right. your application, and then because you have to add, you you request that ahead of time, and you pay for what you request regardless of if you use it or not. Oh, interesting. Ah. Yeah, yeah. So it's not uh, you know if you take something like the Azure Functions model where it's a pure consumption based model, yeah. and you, you know you're just paying merely for what you what your time slices add up to. That's not how Cosmos works um, mm. because of the fact that it has that four nines SLA. You yeah. know, in other words, in order for them it's to got to be up all the time. Exact, and, and and they need to know what you expect. You know, in, in right. other words, it's not like, well, yeah, I need this super high availability thing, the super low latency thing, and I'm just going to pay for whatever I eat. It's just, mm. it's it's impossible to build a, a, a system on that scale. Because it kind of goes against the utility compute model of you know, pay for what you use. Yes, yes, and no. I I, I mean, yes, on uh, on its face, it mm -hmm. does. On the other hand, again, Cosmos, of course, works very well with the that you know something like Azure Functions, that sort of thing, kind of sitting side by side with it and again it's it's uh, its use case is centered around high availability right. low latency and and the, the 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 best way to provide that is again for the the service to, to understand and know what your requirements so are. this is not a replacement for any way you'd want to store data in Azure this is I need no. I have a high availability distributed concern or need and this is the product, that, that should be my first decision, is I need those things, and now I'm going to consider this product. Yeah, there's a few different vectors. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the, the, the high-scale uh, geo, geo redundancy, that's, that sort of thing, is right. those, those are certainly important ones, maybe even the dom at this point the dominant ones. Mm -hmm. I do think that there's a story um, around, maybe you're running a, a Mongo instance right. uh, you know, locally. You don't have necessarily huge scale requirements, but you, but you, you love the schemaless, the, the notion of being schemaless. You love the, the notion of, um, uh, of you know, dealing with JSON and kind of having the, the, those kinds of tools uh, and that kind of ecosystem. Uh, I do think there's a story for uh, m more modest kind of scale requirements, but still but still adopting Cosmos 
so do you sort of see this as we've got a MongoDB local instance right now in a given app, it's gotten big and busier and we're getting more distributed and we're, are we about to commit to trying to figure out how to scale Mongo and instead it's like, hey, I can get that as a service. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's quite literally one of, the, one of the use cases that the team is chasing and, and certainly, I mean, they're, they're trying to make themselves as attractive as they can sure. to yeah. Mongo developers. I, um, I can see this as a really boon, a big boon for IoT. Yeah. Because you've got all these devices that are spread out geographically, they may be all over the world. Right. And they all need to uh, yeah, they all need to have a really fast and, and expansive data collection. Well and think IoT not only for exactly what you just described, Carl, but also Think about uh, think about the situation where maybe you're dealing with millions of devices. You're not dealing with millions of the same device, probably. Yeah. You're not dealing with the same firmware, uh, firmware versions, etc. So essentially, the data. You know, if, if you've got a million devices pushing events up to the cloud mm. and being stored in a database somewhere. How, how can you, yeah, there may be cases yeah. where you can define a schema, but there are probably a lot of other cases where you, it's just not possible. No. And then, you know, and how is the uh, retrieval, I mean, uh, in, a, in something like that? I mean, you're, you're going to be generating tons and tons of data, and to try to make any sense out of that, you know, it's going to take some time and, and effort, isn't yes. it? Yeah. I mean, it, is, it, is it kind of a thing that has to be reduced, and then... Uh, so... So yes, I mean certainly uh, it depends ultimately on uh, kind of how much pre-processing I guess versus post-processing you're and, and to that extent it's it's probably not much different than any other data store really sure, you yeah, know I mean yeah. if if you just want to throw raw you know if if you've got super high throughput needs and scale needs and you just want to throw raw data in there and process it later then you've got interesting uh, uh, connections with things like Data Lake and some yeah. of the other analytics yeah, facilities, exactly. right? Yeah, because um, I tend to think, it was, when you talk about the flood of data coming in from IoT, that you're going to process sometimes later, it seems like a Data Lake scenario. Yep. yep. Yeah, and, it the, does. and the IoT hub is really conducive to that. So, well, and so that's, that's uh, I mean, you mentioned two, the, the, the two big ones right there, and there are others certainly, right. but, but when you talk about uh, you know, Azure as an ecosystem, you know, you, you, when you buy in the Cosmos, Let's be honest. You're probably not just buying into Cosmos. You you've probably implicitly or explicitly bought into Azure as a, as your stack, right? right? Yeah. At least for part of what you're doing. And and also the platform view of Azure too. Right. This is not an IaaS implementation. Exactly. This is a PaaS implementation. Exactly. And that's that's another compelling part of the value proposition. Uh, certainly, when you when you talk to the team and you kind of listen to them sell their product. That's one of the big things mm. that they talk about is, hey, look, you're, you're not spinning up VMs, you're right. not patching. I mean, you know, I mean, it's the same yeah. story we've heard for years, but now it's, it's live, it's real. Right. Um, you're, you're literally just, uh, you, you know, you're, you're paying for the throughput that you ask for and the storage that you, that you require, and you're not managing servers. Josh, give us one second here to pay the bills. This episode of .NET Rocks is made possible in part by Windows on the Google Cloud platform. What? Isn't this a .NET show? Yeah. .NET runs on the Google Cloud platform, man. Everything in .NET? You bet. All the .NET core libraries and more, including 200 plus Google.com and cloud services. Hey, John Skeet's behind it. He's a genius. The John Skeet? The rescue the princess John Skeet from Stack Overflow? <laughs> yeah, the one and only. You can deploy your ASP.NET Windows apps to Compute Engine or your ASP.NET Core apps to App Engine or Container Engine, which is Google's hosted Kubernetes environment, and it runs like, well, Google. But what about Visual Studio integration? Oh, it's there. I'm reading it now. You can use Visual Studio to manage your GCP resources and deploy your existing apps. Yep. You can get stack driver logging, error reporting, and tracing support for .NET and .NET Core. Also, there are PowerShell commandlets for GCP, which run on Windows and Linux. And if you need help, there are a great set of partners to get workloads to GCP, including Capgemini, Nudesic, and Magenic. So go to gcp.netrocks.com and get your free trial today. .NET on Google. Who knew? And we're back. It's .NET Rocks at NDC London talking to Josh Lane about Cosmos DB. Mm. Don't call it Document DB. It's not that anymore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was going to try to do my scary leg. Do, 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 do. But I, I, don't know if that's, uh, I don't know if that's appropriate here. Well, I'm not, already but. excited because it's sort of, I see a clear greenfield problem space and like this IoT scenario and that kind of thing. And I see a clear brownfield scenario of I have a app that's hitting a certain level of success. Maybe we moved it into the cloud to bump it up another notch in scalability. Right. And... 
you know, I've done distributed databases the old fashioned way where I owned multiple data centers and WAN connections, and we actually architected that and operated that stuff You're ourselves. You're wearing a long sleeve shirt, so mm -hmm. I can't see the scars. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. They're all in my head. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I still have hair. So the idea of buying distributed d database services. Uh, you know, as a service, right. it's kind of astonishing. It does freak me out that I have to estimate to you yes. how many units. So, you know, what happens when I go under? What happens when I go over? That's and and uh, I'll begin my answer to that that question by saying you will. <laughs> yes, yes, you're to both. going to be wrong. Yeah, you, yeah, you mm. you are going to be wrong, and and, and ultimately th that is one of the frustrations of adopting the service. But at the same time, y you know, you you so you sort of will narrow in on sure. kind of. You know, uh, and you could look at it as an insurance policy, right? Like I have certainly had the experience of over provisioning a cloud implementation for a weekend, right? Because I w I didn't want the spin up time, and I didn't want to try and scrutinize. So it's like let's throw in some extra and pay that premium, right. so we knew it's working. And the and the responsibility, of course, is on you to come back on Monday morning. Right? How did I do? Um, so, so from a very practical level, uh, every request that you issue through uh, uh, Cosmos has uh, SDKs in .NET, Python, Node, Java, mm -hmm. there's a several others. Uh, and of course, there's a REST API for everything yeah, as well, right. right? Every request you issue, regardless of which of those venue or, or uh, mechanisms you use, uh, the response you get back will tell you exactly how much it costs in sure. request units. You know, so you have, you have the data to sort of figure out. You know, if you're over provisioned, then you you can just sort of see if you're if you've got excess that you can kind of snip away. If you're right. under provisioned, of course, you'll be uh, throttled, and you'll get you'll get a response back from the service, and it'll tell you, hey, yeah. you, you know, you need to you need to. You've bump been up your, throttled exactly. Okay. There's, there's another use case that I can see here, which is using it as a, a state store for the for an actor model system. Sure. Because it's so fast. So, so you uh, one of the the last slides. Uh, I think it was like the very last slide in my talk yesterday. I had some kind of some speculative stuff that I kind of you know uh, hope slash maybe you know start to see the team maybe uh, starting to work on. One mm. of the things I would love to see, frankly, is uh, some some case studies or some frameworks or something that use Cosmos as the foundation for exactly what you're describing, yeah. Carl. Yeah. Um, actor model a kinds game of with state Orleans, mechanism. Yeah, for example. Yeah, uh, but even things like event sourcing. Kind of architectures mm -hmm, sure. or CQRS kind of architectures, yeah. perfect, uh, yeah. perfect vehicle for for storing, say, materialized views. So you know, you're pushing, uh, you know, thousands or millions of, of events per second mm. in a serialized event store, and then you've got some other mechanism behind the scenes that's that's building views uh, asynchronously, storing them as JSON, so that your UI can come in, grab the view it needs, yep. and and away it goes. Keep right on um, going. Yeah, yeah nice. it, it's it's a it's a perfect mechanism for something like that, uh, and, I, and I expect we'll see we'll we'll see that over time. All all right, we need to define a request unit. Because yes, I, I, mean, yeah, I appreciate we, that yeah. <laughs> you're going to make a call and you're going to get back something that says this is how many request units you consume there. Yep. If, if it's more than one, I'm already confused. Yeah, <laughs> so, so a request unit ultimately boils down. It's an abstraction um, mm -hmm. on top of the, the resources, meaning the CPU, the RAM, uh, uh, disk I/O, network I/O, essentially right. all the all the the infrastructure you're consuming to read a single 1K document out of oh. out of the the store. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So and it's a read, not a write. Is well, a that it, it basically every operation has a normalized cost. Can can be can be defined. You know, every every operation in Cosmos, whether it's a read or a write for any any size data, uh, can be uh, you can you can the system the service can determinist deterministically assign a cost to any any operation before perform. execution. Uh, dur I think as part of the execution. Okay, so, so again, you as, when you get a response back from a request, say you know do this thing, update this document for me, push this data. Done. In. This many are you. Yep. This is how this is how much it costs you. Right. Yeah. And so if you aggregate all that, um, again, you can get a sense of. In fact, there are a couple of demos. I've done it myself, but there are a couple of demos on GitHub um, that the team has put out where you can actually watch a meter. It'll just, you know, you've got one thread that's just pushing data, sure. and mm -hmm. you've got another thread which is just showing you requests per second. Mm -hmm. And they're, all they're doing is aggregating the responses and kind of showing it to you. And while I don't imagine it's the best use of a developer's time based on the estimated cost of this, I mean, you could rewrite your code to try and optimize your RUs. Of course. That's yeah. actually something that matters to you. Well, and going one step beyond that, um, again, something 
something I talked about as kind of a speculative thing yesterday uh, during my talk. <laughs> in fact, one of the audience members, this is, the, this is you know, well, I, I sound like I'm bragging a little bit, but you know you've, I think you've done well as a, as a, as a speaker when you're kind of leading the audience where you want them to go. Yeah, they know and it. Just before you get to that slide, the guy says, well, what about this? this. And you say, click. Yeah. click. <laughs> and, yeah. and literally, that happened. And uh, it was awesome. Um, but uh, the guy, he kind of raised his hand and said, I was explaining our use and, and uh, we're talking about this. And he says, well, why couldn't I just use machine learning to, to, and throw a machine learning in front of this. I've got all the data I need mm -hmm. and, right. I can, and I can figure out over time, uh, instead of me guessing what my provision throughput is, right. I, can, I can use a machine learning algorithm to figure it out for me. Right. Because the other aspect of this, which I haven't mentioned yet, is you specify how, many, uh, how much throughput, how many RUs per second you need oh, for I a collection. See. You specify that ahead of time, but you can adjust that and at the, any time. There's, an, there's a, an API. There's an API yeah. for, for adjusting So you that. could have the machine learning thing handle the API and adjust it automatically. Precisely. Precisely. Beauty. Yep. When is that going to be a service? Yeah. Exactly. yeah really. Well, <laughs> on the one hand, that's that's one of those things where you're like, okay, well, you know, Microsoft is, you know, uh, it has has thousands of smart people who figure this stuff out all the sure. time, right? And so you think, well, we'll kind of wait around. It'll be there in six months or so. But on the on the other hand, you're like, that sure would be fun to build. You yeah. know, I would yeah. love to I would love to go build something like that myself. It's and, also you know. quite a specific case because in the yeah. end, you have to you're presenting a certain data set of relevance to you. Like, I, it would be uh, hard to generalize that. It would be interesting to see, oh, yeah, 95% yeah, of our RUs are actually done by the, the machine learning algorithm. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, right. Well, I guess <laughs> the answer is to stop that. Yes, yeah, so I can save money by not observing <laughs> by it. By not <laughs> observing it. <laughs> right. That's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, exactly. That's not cynical at all. Goodness knows. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm really fascinated by this just because you know you know how hard the hard parts of that actually is. I mean, I guess the logical thing to do is to go in initially over provisioning and then dial it back as you learn more about your consumption. I, I think mm -hmm. so. Yes. If um, you can, unless the throttling is not the big a deal, because you're only just going to slow down. You're not going to break. It mm -hmm. depends. But exactly, and it depends upon your use case. Right. And, and, and I, I I hate to say it depends because the people I've t asked this question before will say mm -hmm. it depends. And right. it's, you know, it's like you're kind of passing it's, the buck. It's, but it's like turtles all the way down. It's, it's, it depends <laughs> all the way down. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Nobody wants to talk about underwear that much. Uh, oh, wait, that's a different thing. <laughs> yeah. Dude, let me do the jokes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm <right>? sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this, is why, this is why he, he does the jokes in advance. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, He's a planner. <laughs> so I, I will say the other thing that, that I, even though this is frust it can be frustrating mm -hmm. to, to kind of figure this out, as a, as, a, as a software developer and as an architect, as a guy who's been doing this for a long time, this does, in a way, kind of get me in a place that, that makes me happy because it, it's a bit of a forcing function yeah. for folks who are adopting the database sure. to understand your application, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, how many times have you, I mean, you guys, I know, have done, maybe still do consult, you, you guys mm -hmm. still do consulting. Yeah, yeah. sure, so, yeah. And, and I have too, and it's like you walk in with a team, and let's be honest, I mean, I, 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 should, I should throw myself under the bus too. I've been guilty of this before. I, you, you, you write code, you build an app, and somebody comes along and says, it, maybe in the old days it was, well, how big, you know, how big does our database need to be? How many racks do we need to buy? Right. How, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And you go, uh, don't know. Don't know. <laughs> how yeah. much money you got? Yeah. <laughs> right. and, and that's obviously not the right answer. Right. Um, it's not the right answer here either. Mm. But you, in order to be successful, you, you sort of need to say, stop and go, okay, team, we need to sit down. We need to start doing a little, uh, do some QA testing, do some, some, some kind of real world analysis of what this thing's going to do, how it's going to mm. behave. Right. Yeah. And yeah, we're going to get it wrong. You probably need to over provision the start. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. But as, as an ongoing process, we'll narrow down and we'll get to the point where, um, hey, no, we've, we've kind of figured it out. There, right. there are some, I, the other thing I'll mention, there are some calculators online. So if you go to the, the Cosmos DB docs, yeah. um, somewhere in there, there's, they give you some calculators. Um, so you can do things like paste in your, some sample JSON and say, well, I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to update, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit, yeah, uh, submit 500,000 of these per mm. second. Right. You know, what's that going to cost me? Mm -hmm. That kind of so thing. So it's doing an RU estimation. Yeah, exactly. And so you can, you can, you can kind of get some ballparks uh, to start with. I don't know about not totally flying blind. I don't know about you, but um, trying to figure out your Azure build is really hard. Yes. And there, I know there's an API for billing. And actually, one of our AppV Next guys went to work on the in the billing system at Microsoft. Hmm. But that's one of those things that um, I don't. 
I used to spend a little bit more time in the, on the AWS, in the AWS world. Um, I don't spend as much anymore, but that's always one of the things that I've been kind of, kind of secretly jealous of, uh, of the, yeah. on the AWS side of the fence is they have an entire ecosystem uh, of third party folks who do nothing more than, for yeah. instance, uh, optimize your billing. Right, um, billing estimates. Yeah, exactly. And I, there are some folks who do that on the Azure side, yeah, there, certainly. Yeah, there are a few. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things here is like the time and effort it takes to do that kind of optimization, you better know how much you're spending in the first place. Right. Because right. if you're only spending a couple hundred dollars, you really shouldn't spend a lot of time focusing yeah. on that. Like you'll make yourself crazy. Right. And if you knock it out of the part, you're going to knock 20% of that off? Hey, yeah. 40 bucks. E like, exactly. Is right. this really the best use of your time? Well, I think the good news is we're a little bit beyond uh, in 2017. Well, maybe not completely, but we're a little bit beyond the, the days where uh, you know, cloud was super scary, yeah. and the yeah. and the CFO was like, "What do you mean? This is you know, is th I'm not. This isn't a capital expense anymore." And mm. yeah. uh, you know, I, you still hear those sometimes. Well, and, that, and it's that sense that I don't know how much I'm going to spend this month, right? Right. You don't want to be a cellular telephone company. Surprise! <laughs> you went out of your area, and your right. bill is gigantic. Right. Exactly. You know, exactly. That, that's. I think it's a realistic fear, even if yeah. it's not actually manifest. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's completely reasonable. If, if, if any of us were in the, sh the shoes of a CFO, I think we'd, we'd Absolutely. be there. So. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is. Uh, I must be that happy time again. Yeah. It's time to consider how many megabytes there are in the cosmos. Billions and <laughs> billions. <laughs> we knew this was coming. There you go. <laughs> Carl Sagan's back. Yeah. And he's got Cosmos DB. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually time to give away a DevExpress D Experience subscription to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. Become a UI superhero with DevExpress UI controls and libraries and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today and leverage your existing knowledge to build next generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an Office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. And check out their new DevExtreme React grid, built from the ground up to fully support all the cool features that come with React, like the virtual DOM, state controllers like Redux, etc. It supports master detail, sorting, grouping, paging, and editing, and you can check it out and test it for free by getting it from GitHub. And learn more and download your free 30-day trial of DevExpress Universal at devexpress.com slash superhero. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Kyle Hodgson. Congratulations, Kyle. Yeah. Golf clap for you, sir. Absolutely. And Kyle just won the D-Experience subscription. That's a big pile of awesome from our friends at DevExpress just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you don't know what that is, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, Answer a few questions and join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the fan club. But you got to sign up to win. And, of course, we like to ask our guest, Josh, if you had $5,000 to spend on technology today, what would you buy? So I thought a lot about this. I, I am not actually a huge gadget guy, um, but... Uh, because I am a, an aspiring or, or at least a uh, enthusiastic drummer, um, I think what I would spend my five thousand dollars on is a uh, is a signature Ludwig John Bonham nice. amber colored uh, drum kit. You know, with the with the double floor toms yeah, and the, ridicu old, the ridiculous kick drum, big old kick drum. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> really, really annoy the neighbors. Yeah, do it. If I'm going to do it, do it proper. Do, do something it shiny. Right. Yes. Yeah. And if I had any money left over, then maybe get some lessons, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, you know, I wonder if there isn't, because I know you've done stuff like this, gone, gone and done a, a course or a sort of tutorial with a top-tier guitar player. Oh, yeah, sure. I wonder if there's equivalent in the drumming space, you know? Yeah, there are. There sort are of drum an experience clinics. drumming, like a weekend with a, a top-tier drummer. Se I've seen some, uh, there was a, actually a, a, a documentary on somewhere on Netflix. Uh, it's a camp. I think it's a camp for kids, but... I don't know, maybe mm. they take me. I don't know, but right. it's up. It's up in Canada. Uh, it's on a lake somewhere in the middle of nowhere. No cell phones, whatever. I, I think you. I think you literally fly a float plane in. Nice. But it's they brought uh, really great uh, 
industry drummers and they just play for a weekend and you know yeah. they're out they're like out on the dock like in front of the lake and playing at 6 a.m and it, it was yeah it's pretty cool i yeah, don't remember what it was sort of the fantasy camp yep, thing exactly yeah. yeah exactly you know we got enough stuff we're really after experiences exactly these days, right? exactly i right. uh i spent a week at yorma kalkinen's guitar camp oh and uh took lessons from him that's fantastic that he awesome. also got yeah. yorma to record his uh his voicemail message. Yeah, you call right. Carl, and he does it as he goes, "Hey, this is Yorba." He goes, "Carl's busy stealing my licks, but if you leave him a message, he'll get back to you, or he'll think about getting back to you." That's something awesome. Like that. Yeah, that's great. That was yep. fun. he's never changing that I was message. Say, you'll never change that. Of course. You know, when I first got my drum kit, and this was in 2000, I hadn't played, I hadn't had a drum kit until then. I the the holy grail of drumming for me was Bernard Purdy's Purdy Shuffle. Absolutely, uh, is that something that's on your list to do? That is that is on my list to do. Yeah. Um, uh, that's uh, so. I mean, I'm sure you've seen like the YouTube videos oh, yeah, of him. Oh yeah, he's great. It, it's it's 25 minutes of him, and he's just doing a monologue. Yeah, right? he's do. It's like a it's like a comedy stand up routine. He's yeah. playing drums at the same time. Right. Switching like this switching groove. times. All of a sudden, yeah. he goes Psst, on the hi hat. He goes. Ow! Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that was awesome. Let's yes. do that again. You know, <laughs> well, he's and, so funny. And of course there's all the all the derivative stuff that, that comes from that as well. Yeah. Um uh, uh Bonham uh Fool in the Rain comes yeah. from that. Sure. And um, Rosanna. Rosanna, Jeff the Picaro. Rosanna Shuffle. He put those two he's, beats together and then Yep. Yeah, yep. and then the, the the two songs by Steely Dan that he did the Purdy Shuffle on were uh Home at Last and mm -hmm. and uh Babylon Sisters. Great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. Drumming geeks. That will uh, <laughs> that will that will be several years down the road. But again, that's the beauty of yeah. of kind of adopting and doing something like this. You you know, it's like it's okay. It's a process, and I don't. Right. I'm not. There's no. I'm, there's no end game. No, just, no, just no. Gonna, it's just fun. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's, it's another it's one of those mastery elements, just like software it's development. Therapy. If I'm a, if I'm if I'm very honest, it's also a great excuse to get together with my friends sure. and drink a little beer. Absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah, and have a and, good time and so. make something at exactly. the same time, right? exactly. Even if it's just for your, for each exactly. other. You're jumping back into this thing, I get that it's all geo replicated and so forth. But what if I don't need that? Can I just specify what geo is it in, or is it always replicated across? No, it's by default. You pick a region. You say this is where I start. This is okay. my master. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Cosmos DB is a single master, multi -read, multi -re uh, reader model. Okay. So there's always one master. Okay. Um, that's the region that you start in. Right. And if you're happy, you don't need anything else. You can certainly stay there. You you have three. Uh, even if you're in a single region, you have three local. Uh, regions, uh, intra-region copies of your right. data maintained. That's true, so, like mm. SQL Azure as well. They exactly. always maintain three copies. Exactly. Um, but if you need multiple uh, regions, then literally you go into the you go into the portal. You can make an API call uh, and say, "I want to be here. I want to be here. I want to be here." Any any uh, Cosmos is in all regions. It's uh, 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 the Azure folks are refer to it as a ring zero service. Interesting. Wow. Which means it's that like a it's, CPU it's always it's a, yeah exactly, um, and it's always there. So it's you know you know how they release a new service and sometimes it takes a little while for it to percolate to all the data centers right cosmos is in every data center from day one can right. you specify um, in the sla how fast uh, replication happens yeah it's uh it's i'm gonna get it wrong it's either 30 minutes or 60 minutes i can't remember that's oh, okay. and that's the that's the the upper upper bound um so when the, i write to the master it's going to be 30 to 60 minutes later the median it's going to be supposedly out. the median is much less than that and on the order of uh a couple of minutes, maybe okay. even less. Um, I'm probably getting that number wrong too. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, of course, at, at the end of the day, the SLA has to have a, a reasonable upper bound. Yeah, sure. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so you 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 designate uh, multiple uh, replicas, and if you need you, if you need to do, um, you know, uh, obviously the the interesting you get into interesting scenarios where you have mul folks in or application instances or users in multiple geographies, yeah. and they need to do writes, and you want those writes to be fast and local. Um, so there are some interesting patterns around maintaining multiple masters, which essentially means multiple Cosmos accounts. But sure. then you can you can still kind of integrate the data, and there's there's some good documentation on doing. If you have the opposite problem, what if you want to delay, like based on the time zone? You know, like if you wanted to have something that happened at 8 p.m. everywhere. Do you know what I mean? Something, some data that exists at, eight, you know. Well, I so mean, it, it, that's sort of an application function, but I... 
so you can do things. I'm, I'm trying to think of trying to think of how you might set that up. I, yeah. Probably the way you would do that is using the uh, the manual failover uh, uh, functionality mm. in Cosmos. Um, it has you can set it up once you replicate into multiple multiple geographies. You can set it up for prioritized uh, mm. auto auto failover. Hmm. So you can say I'm you know I'm in East US. That's my primary. And if that goes down, automatically fail over here. But and we are talking about. Azure nodes going down. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. that would be that would be like a, the the service itself is unreachable, which probably means other stuff. Pretty is rare. Un, right. Yeah. Um, but getting back to Carl's uh, question, you can also initiate a manual failover. Honey. Um, which is really handy for things like testing your DR uh, scenarios. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, it's not enough to just have a DR uh, plan. You have, actually have to exercise it. Um, but you could probably achieve what you were describing by essentially, it's an API call or a yeah. button click and just say, you know, fail over at this particular time. And DR, data replication? Yes, that sorry, that, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, no, uh, disaster, disaster recovery. recovery. Disaster yeah, recovery. Yeah, sorry. Um, Any maximum sizes or other limits? Uh, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's unlimited. As big um, as you want it to be. Yeah, um, primarily because uh, Cosmos works on the, the uh, we're, it's auto-partitioned, basically. Mm -hmm. so, so a collection of, of documents, a collection of JSON that you store um, does not have to be pr pr uh, uh, partitioned, mm -hmm. but you, you can and usually will uh, specify a partition key, which is just basically a JSON path right. um, into the document. Uh, and the, whatever value exists at the end of that path that's the value that that the service uses to partition out the the uh, the documents. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So great. and that can scale horizontally, you know, effectively forever. Nice. Um, the, the 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 I mean, of course, there is, you know, there there is a uh, a certain data set. You know, the, there's only so many data centers and that kind of thing. But right. but the uh, the point is, you know, I mean, they they have. You can go on the portal and you say if you you know you can provision up to you know whatever a million requests per per second. Uh, but if you need more than that, give us a call. Right. And yeah. you know, they your guys are willing to take more money for more performance. Ex exactly. Sure. Um, exactly. What about rollbacks to previous states, like as opposed to an offline backup? Like you do get uh, automated backups. Um, I, there is not a uh, that I'm aware of. There is not a kind of an automated way or or a uh, uh, a way to sort of roll back to a prior version. Oh, okay. Um, that that I'm, I'm not aware that that exists. But you certainly can. You get essentially backups uh, happen every four hours. Right. Um, and they store the last two or three, uh, as I recall. And so you you know it's a at, at the moment you have to put in a support request. Right. Um, they are working on. If they've pull, they've, been, they've pull, been asked for an API to do it. So, yeah. Just yeah. to automate that. But it's the same yeah. thing of like what if you don't te detect a corrupt in data for a month. Right. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you're like, I need to get back before that month to get this piece that's been damaged. At the moment, they only, uh, the service only maintains backups for a certain length of time. Right. I don't know if, if they keep them longer and you just have to put in an extra super support call. I'm not yeah. sure how that works. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Are there any hidden gotchas that we haven't already talked about? We haven't talked. We mentioned the the, the data can, uh, the notion of consistency levels, and we right. haven't really gone into that yet. Mm -hmm. um, so let me let me cover that real quick because it is an important uh, differentiator for the service. So most NoSQL stores, uh, most databases in general support. Uh, if you're talking about relational databases, they support what's what's known as transactional strong consistency. Yep, sure. Right. Everybody kind of yep. knows how that works more or less. Yep. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have eventual consistency, mm -hmm. which is I push an update to my distributed database, and eventually all of the updates will propagate to the other replicas, the other the other nodes in the in the cluster. Right. Mm -hmm. And most most uh, uh, NoSQL databases support one or the other. A few of them support both, um, but Cosmos supports five. It supports hmm. it supports those two. I which can't are, name five. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, there are, supposedly uh, from academia there are fifty some odd distinct oh. identifiable uh, consistency Super levels. Yes. Okay. Um, mm. uh, there are uh, the the two extremes, uh, strong and eventual, and then uh, Cosmos supports three others. It supports the uh, basically in, in order from. Uh, from uh, strongest consistency and then moving towards uh, lowest latency, best overall throughput and performance, right. mm -hmm. you, have, you, uh, you have strong consistency, which of course gives you the, the worst overall latency, but gives you that, that strong transactional guarantee. Right. You have something called bounded staleness, which is basically eventual consistency with an upper bound. Okay. Uh, you know, ins instead of saying it's eventually consistent and we don't really, we don't really guarantee what eventual means, you, you as a adopter of the service say, I want bounded staleness and this is the maximum time or the maximum number of versions that, yeah. that I allow, I, that my application is okay with the data getting out of date. Right. Um, so you, do, you can do that.
that. And that gives you a little bit better performance. The, really what it is, it's, it, you're, it costs you less from a, the request units. Um, uh, it costs a little bit less than using strong consistency. Mm. Um, after that, you have something called session uh, consistency, which is very good for a applications that have a, an inherent notion of a session. So we were talking about IoT before. Yeah, yeah. Every device is pushing, pushing its own events, maybe, doing, re maybe reading its own state a little bit when it boots back up. Right. That's kind of inherently, implicitly a session. Um, so that works very well. If you use that, then, for example, you avoid problems like be, uh, not being able to read your own writes. If I, if I push an update uh, and I'm using session consistency, I can immediately issue a query and mm -hmm. make sure that I get that right, right. That, that, that update back. I see it. Um, so the last one, moving towards eventual consistency, is called consistent prefix. Hmm. And the idea of consistent prefix is it's basically eventual consistency with one, with one kind of uh, helpful addition or, or capability, which is I won't see uh, writes out of order. So oh. imagine if you're building like a queuing system, right? right. This, that's kind of the canonical example or, or use case for this. You're, you're, you're for whatever reason, you're using uh, 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 Cosmos as a queuing system. Uh, and it, with, if you're using pure eventual consistency, you get optimal, awesome throughput. Right. But it you might as, be out of order. You as a reader might see my updates out of order. Sure. Yeah. So, so uh, a consistent prefix ensures that that doesn't happen. Yeah. So that even if other ones arrive out of order, you don't make them visible until the next one in order arrives. Then you'll roll them all in. Pre precisely. Mm -hmm. so yep. in a, you know, TCP and PI actually does that kind of under the hood as yep. well. Right. Right. But it will hang on to those things if it can. It'll buffer overflow if it can't. But... Exactly. You know. So, so that's so from a from a again from a kind of adoption of the service standpoint. That's that's the other sort of big question mark you have to uh, answer. You have to understand your application. Yeah. Which, you which of those models fits? Right. right. If you need, if you if you sort of de facto say, well, I came from the, the the relational world. Transactional consistency makes sense to me. I must have that. Sure. You're going to pay for that from a from a, a request units per second. Uh, sure. A request unit standpoint. Yeah. Um, it's going to cost you more in the bill. Right to maintain yeah. that thing. And, yep. and so yeah, you can play back and forth. But I, I do like to do some gradation there, not yes. just whatever yep. arrives, arrives. Yes. And yeah. Yep. You know what ends up happening when you're like that is if it's, you're unhappy with it, you start writing code around it. Exactly. And that's you its own Try to solve it yourself. Yeah, and that's, right. that's, like, that's when you, you're in trouble. You really should When you do get that. there, stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> stop digging the hole. <laughs> you're going down a dark path <laughs> that's only going to make everybody sad. Yes. You know, it's like I've, I've known people who, you know, talk about TCP IP doing the same thing. They like UDP's performance, so they start, but they don't want consistency, so they start writing their own version of TCP IP over UDP. And it's like, yes. you, you need to stop. This, is, this isn't a good idea. I, we, we, I, could, uh, I could go on and on, actually, and add my own flavors of these stories, and yep. we probably don't have time for nope, all that. No, nope, so. true. <laughs> but it's, it's, own, it's his own illness. It's like, you, you trust that the guys who wrote that, that's the version that's built in, have thought about it longer than you have. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. Stand yeah. on the shoulders of giants. That's right. one mm -hmm. of my favorite uh, sayings. No, what, are some, what are some other great use cases for, um, for Cosmos TV? So, so we talked about IoT. That's, uh, you know, I, I, three big buckets, I think. Mm. Um, certainly, if you if you have the notion of geoscale and you and you you're either there already or right. you anticipate yeah. getting there, that's an obvious one. But quite frankly, I mean, you, if you look at like uh, uh, SQL DB now in Azure, I mean, yep. it has some some notions of geoscale as well. Mm -hmm. right. um, uh, in fact, I think there's there'll be some. Uh, I don't ever expect those products to become one just because right. they are distinct yeah. Um, yeah. for a reason. Um, but you'll see more. I think you'll see more convergence and more kind of uh, kind of uh, parallel feature set, uh, and, and which is good. Yeah, also, but not also an easy thing to move between either. If you're right. deeply committed to the RDMS model right. and the SQL Server model, jumping over to a graph database or a document database is just a different way of thinking. Right, exactly, yeah. so exactly. It's good that they will keep raising the bar on scalability, although it's pretty high already for SQL Azure. But right. if you're not fixed on that relational model, you know, I can think of another particular really good uh, platform case for a non-relational scaling model. So there's IoT. Um, well, uh, well, I'm talking about, talking about uh, other oh. products. Like, I know we could do it with a bunch of different things, but it's nothing that's out of the box, pre-configured, buy it as a service. That so, I can think of. Well, I mean, like, may, like maybe like messaging, that kind of thing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly, like you mentioned IoT Hub earlier. I think that's a good example of something where, again, if you're dealing with devices strewn all over uh, the world um, or, or just a large geography, I mean, I think uh, scaling that uh, uh, geographically, it, yeah. I think there's some, there's some interesting elements there. I just um, think that a lot of folks struggle with, am I ever going to have a problem this big? Right, and, right. And, and if I'm not sure, am I making decisions that impair my ability to get there if that problem does? show up. Well, so I get that. Mm -hmm. I actually get that question a lot when mm -hmm. I was when I was doing consulting. Um, 
And the way I used to answer that question is this. Uh, well, it was Mark Andreessen, right, who said uh, a couple years ago, software is eating the world, yep. right? Yeah, now right. Every, everybody's, a, everybody's a software company yes. now. Um, and you know, now it's, we're moving into this age where everybody's a data and analytics company, right? right? Yeah. And, you know, and you can overblow this a little bit and, and, uh, uh, and, and be a little too bombastic. But, but I do think there's some truth to that. Sure. And I do think that um, it, it, it may be true that today you can't, you, you know, you're in a situation where you can't envision the need for geoscale data. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to come. Sure, um, sure. So, sure. Uh, g getting back to your question real, real quick, Carl, about other use cases, um, gaming is another one, which yeah. uh, again, I think with uh, latency, is such a big deal. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, very so very low latency uh, type scenarios. Gaming is an obvious one. Right. Um, and and uh, the Xbox team I know is is making use of Cosmos today. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other one uh, we mentioned this earlier. I, I, I do think um, I do think that there is a. Uh, there, there's a use case or, or a, uh, a story for again. If you're a Mongo developer, you know your 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 requirements are constrained from mm. a, a scale standpoint. But yeah. you like NoSQL. You don't you don't have a you don't want a relational store. You don't sure. want to predefine your schema. You can still be very happy. It can be very cost efficient. Again, you have some of those those things you have to work out. How's my app? What, what kind of throughput do I need? What consistency level do I want? Um, but if you work those things out, you can be very cost effective. You're not managing a Mongo server right. uh, yeah. at that at that point. Again, you get rid of owning the operating system, owning the yeah. uh, the the updates of the app itself. Yep. Dealing with the security models, not to poke too much fun at, at, at Mongo. Yeah, right. You right. Know, yeah. There's, there's a lot of elements here. Exactly. That exactly. It um, it's yeah, it's very interesting to me. It's like uh, how hard it is to to for the brownfield scenarios where it's like, well, what is it going to take to shift? How do we do this seamlessly? So table storage is a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, they just they just released that that table storage compatibility layer. So Mongo, they obviously have they've had Mongo for a little while. Mm -hmm. The table storage one is interesting because again, I, I think what the team's looking for are uh, big big groups of developers who where there's maybe a latent need to right. consider something else. And they're right? getting ready to gear up to build something hard in terms of distributed data storage. And right. Right. and uh, are dreading it because they're smart right. and think, oh, you know I mean I can buy this off the shelf? I'll, I'm very interested in that. Right. I've already got version one of, of this app that's talking to table storage, and now I, I want to scale it even more. Right. Um, and table storage isn't going anywhere, by no. the way. I mean, we should we should clarify that. But it, you know, if you if you if you want to explore something new, you don't want to rewrite your app. Now all of a sudden you can uh, give it a different connection string, yeah. point it at Cosmos, and and party on. And a lot of things are the same. Can we revisit the replication time? Because if um, if it's going to take an average of two minutes to replicate, and I'm playing a game, and I'm in, you know, on the East Coast of the United States, and my friend is in Australia. Uh, do I have any control over which database, which one that they hit? Um, I, I can't really count on that for, I mean, it's great to have one millisecond latency, but right. if there's going to be a two or three minute lag right. to replicate. So the, the I th my, my, we're, we're architecting our game on the fly here, so. Yeah, um, sure. But, but yeah, you're, you're exactly right. The, the, the cross database, or, or the cl cross data center story isn't really for the low latency. I mean, it's not going to solve that problem. No, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the way that you would solve that problem in Cosmos is you use what's called the, the multi-homing capability of the, of the APIs, okay. or the ability to either multi-home or to designate specifically, this is the data center I want to talk sure. to. Oh, so when you, when you basically, when you connect to Cosmos programmatically mm -hmm. and, and say this is the one that I, or this is how I'm going to connect, you either specify, I want to connect to my Cosmos instance in this data center right. precisely, or you give it an abstract, abstract URL and say I just want to I, I want to connect to my Cosmos instance right. and then you specify you can specify a priority order obviously so, you're trying yeah. to find the best the best the lowest latency right. based on where they are geographically right. how exactly. much time it's going to take to exactly. get through the network blah 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 so yeah. if yep. I'm thinking about a game like this like World of Tanks yeah just decided an example has a North American game server and mm. a European game yep. server and an Asian game server for a reason. You'll never bump into non-North American players in the North American game server. If you play from Europe on a North American server, which you can do, right. you're just taking a latency hit. Exa exactly. And they want low, exactly. you know, you want to play on the server closest to you so that you have the advantage of low ping. Right. Yeah. And if somebody's silly enough to play further away, you have an advantage over them. Well, and, and, and let's be let's be clear. I mean, there, there's still a story there for replicated data because, yep. you know, you, you've still got 
fairly, you don't have sub, uh, sub second latency, no. but you've still got good latency for replicating the data around the world. So yeah, you sure. can do things like throw up the big leaderboard uh, for everybody on right. in sure. the whole universe. Some and, that and doesn't matter if it's a couple minutes yeah. late. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. It's one of the things that World of Tanks doesn't do is if you play on the American server and then you go log on to the European server, none of your stuff's there. You make a separate account. Right. It'd be kind of nice that if you, ah, I really want to play right. in this tournament in Europe, I'm going to be able to have my all my stuff in all the servers. Exactly. They, clearly, they yeah. should be using Cosmos DB. Absolutely. Clearly. <laughs> clearly. Yeah. Russian company. I'm thinking no. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is great. Josh, thanks so much. This yeah, guys. Awesome. I, lo I loved it. Thanks for having me. Well, and, and yeah, we were, we've been sort of wondering all about Cosmos DB since we saw it at Build, and I'm glad we got a chance to dig into it. So great thanks stuff. again. Great stuff. Thanks, guys. All right. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a, a toy boy. Life is hard. Pay my taxes.